Ron, you know, a lot of people are very familiar with, you know, with Quantum Bigfoot and also the Sierra Sounds. I think the Sierra Sounds is probably one of the, um, the biggest things out there. Um, you know, it's got a lot of uh, awareness and, I guess, popularity, if that's the right way to put that. Um, you know, first of all, uh, if you don't mind, I actually would like to uh, watch well, before we get into that. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to see if we can get into a, a brief bio. Um, you kind of give us a rundown. Um, like, what got you started and in, in involved with Bigfoot? Well, I, uh, I, well, we're, none of us were looking for Vic, but there's six of us in this uh, remote hunting camp in the Sierra Nevadas, California, and uh, this started in 1971. Uh, two of the older gentlemen uh, are deceased now. They, they started going hunting there since 1958. It's about eight miles into the wilderness, and a very imposing area to get to, and nobody else is around. But they always tagged out on their deer every year, and. Uh, Anybody went up there with them to hunt would do the same, but they kind of kept the area pretty private. Well, these creatures came in one night, left a big big footprint by the stove in the mud, and uh, that was in 71. And uh, they knew it wasn't a bear. They're avid hunters, uh, marksmen, and the sounds it made wasn't a bear. It was really making some horrific sounds. And then when they did go out later after the sounds uh, stopped, they noticed this track. And that's what got them into thinking this must be a Bigfoot. Well, I knew them personally. Uh, they came out and told the rest of us. And uh, so we all started going up there every chance we got. I went up every chance I got. And I took a tape recorder, all of us did. In 1972, we invited uh, a journalist in uh, to document something to find out what's going on. That was uh, called Alan Berry. And Alan Berry uh, was an investigative reporter working in uh, Redding, California at the time. And uh, anyway, uh, Alan uh, came down and interviewed us uh, to see uh, to see if he could go in. So we, we took him in 1972. He, so he took a, a good recorder in and uh, taped the creatures too. But he started uh, trying to find someone that would uh, study the sounds because the vocalizations were very unique. Uh, none of us guys up there really realized how unique they were, and I didn't until later on when people said, well, we've heard the same thing, but we've never recorded them, or they yell, or they scream, or something like that. So anyway, it got me involved in it, because uh, I went back up with them. I wasn't a hunter until then that I started hunting, but I don't hunt anymore. Uh, but uh, that was exciting. It still is exciting up there. Awesome. Did that, did that get uh, you started? I ramble on sometimes. <laughs> oh no, no, that's no, that's good. That's good. We actually appreciate anyone who likes to ramble on and talk. <laughs> I, I, if I get started on something, I can go and go and go, and you know, I, I might, I might get people lost when I start talking. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Now, now this. Well, um, anyway, let me I'm let sorry. me just finish that. No, I'm that's, that's fine. I was just going to finish that one part off. Alan Berry got, finally got a professor at the University of Wyoming to study these sounds because uh, these creatures were chattering amongst themselves. But you need a professional behind you to say, oh, that's what that was. Well, Dr. Curlin, uh, he analyzed the sounds for a year, studied them, and, and uh, came out with, with a report, which was presented at uh, UCB, uh, University of British Columbia, in 1980. And anyway, it's in a book, Man Like Monsters on Trial, uh, the range that uh, he studied of these sounds supersedes what a human can normally do. He shows a, a graph in that book. And uh, so that was a big uh, hit as far as uh, scientific work goes. Alan Berry fostered that. And, uh, but it wasn't until 2008 until the cryptolinguist Scott Nelson heard the sounds on the uh, BFRO uh, website. And he said, that sounds like, because he's a cryptolinguist trained by the military to recognize uh, uh, different languages or transcribe different languages is a better way to put it. And uh, he came all the way out from Missouri where he teaches languages and uh, got the context of the sounds and we got the original copies of the original sounds so he could uh, check them out. And he went back and studied them and made a statement that there is a definite complex language within these sounds uh, by the human definition of language. If you'd like me to explain that, I can do that. But the human definition of language is a morphine stream of words which make a cognizant, sapient sentence. Now, only humans are supposed to have that attribute. But these things have that attribute. So 
a whole lot of, of thoughts in my mind anyway, and that's why I'm here talking to you, Daniel. So we can Oh yeah. Just, and, you know, I've written uh, two books. Yeah, I've written two books. Uh, the Voices in the Wilderness is my 40-year chronicle in that mountainous area, uh, dealing with these things and what I've gone through, the different trips I've made uh, all, all over the world, really, into Peru and Nepal and Russia, Siberia, and uh, all those trips uh, I mentioned in my book, uh, Quantum Physics. Some of them are in the uh, Voices in the Wilderness, and that comes with a CD, and it's just my story. For it is easy to write. Because uh, it's just my story. All you got to do is write it and get someone to edit. But I include a CD with it, which uh, has the. When I get to the context of the sound I'm talking about in the story, you'll be able to hear the sound on the CD. Or these are all downloadable on my website too. My second book was uh, the Quantum Bigfoot, which you discussed earlier a little bit. It's my where where this 45, 46 years of dealing with this subject has brought me, and all the things I've looked into all over the world and, and it's just uh, I, I it was not an easy book like the first one it was a hard book because I did a lot of research uh, quote a lot of uh, physicists in there and I kind of uh, trying to put like Einstein and Bohr did they, they kind of had spirituality and quantum physics on the same plane I do for sure because uh, you hear I was raised in a church as a Christian and I, I read the Bible quite a bit and uh I understand how religion comes from things. I'm not really, I don't consider myself a religious person at this time, but I i am a spiritual person, as you are, as we all are, made in the image of a very special entity. So anyway, this, uh, this book gets into bringing the science and spirituality back together, because quantum physics is a science. It's called modern science. And uh, where the Newtonian physics, which is 1687, uh, is based on principles of motion and uh, things you can see and hear and smell your senses, basically. Quantum physics is uh, quantum physics is getting into the way the whole universe works, all the way down to the smallest part of your of your cell. And uh, all, we're all energy at a basic level. And uh, so I get into all that and how it might relate to Bigfoot. So I'm jabbering on again. Just stop me and ask me a question anytime you feel oh, like. Oh no. No, you're absolutely fine because one of the things you just said sparked something that uh, just came to my mind because uh, one individual actually just recently asked you uh, something, and one of the things you mentioned that relates to the energy, uh, to everybody having an energy, um, I guess that's where vibrational frequency comes into, right? That, that's that's what I got that term from, yeah, because you mentioned it earlier, and that's where I picked that up at. I said, what is vibrational frequency uh, so i looked it up and you know i got a brief definition out of it and so but um i don't know if you if you feel uh could, if you don't mind could you kind of maybe go into that and explain that a little bit more well, sure everything everything in existence has a frequency and we live in three-dimensional world you know our three dimensions and it's based upon light if you didn't have light you wouldn't see these things so um Vibrational frequency is uh, the string theory. It goes right down to the smallest part of your body. Everything vibrates at a frequency. If you can locate that frequency, you can actually move something. And as you might think, you can move a mountain. <laughs> but you mm. got to have its frequency. That's the, uh, that's why quantum physics uh, is based, I think, there's a lot in spirituality. If you read the red letter edition, the New Testament, of what Christ, how he, what he said to do, he said, what I'm doing you can do. Well, none of us are really running around walking on water. I know a few people that have drowned, but, <laughs> but we're not walking on water. So we haven't reached what we're supposed to reach as human beings, in my opinion. Uh, so we were originally designed with all this. We lost it in the metaphorical Garden of Eden, I guess you want to call it. But no, actually, that was a real garden. It's just what happened there is subject to debate. But anyway... Uh, it wasn't until Christ came who was called the second Adam who brought back all our connections that we lost in that garden. And uh, so, yeah. so if you read what he says, and don't get religion in your way, but read what he says, uh, you find that uh, quantum physics just gels with it 100% so far that I can find. And I mean, his miracles, the way he did them, uh, just 
the word talk about faith, well, that's because you got to believe quantum physics because you'll never see it. You know, you won't see right. uh, in that dimension, those dimensions. But according to the quantum physics, there's 11 dimensions uh, at least. And and we can prove that through mathematical equations. It's been proven. And I think every physicist, uh, at least they say there's over a million physicists that agree with that. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, if there's other dimensions and we're only living in three, what's going on in the other ones? Well, I think religion might call that heavens. And uh, I yeah. think we... <laughs> in quantum physics, so we call it dimensions. So I kind of go with that throughout the end of the book, but I base also the enigmas associated with Bigfoot that I've run into, and now by after talking to people for 45 better years, uh, <clears throat> that there's something strange going on with these things. And Bigfoot, so that's the quantum Bigfoot in my book, and that's I try to relate these strange things that happen to quantum theory and quantum physics. By the way, I mean, can I give a definition here of theory and quantum mechanics? Oh, yeah. The theory, the theory is established, uh, but it's always called a theory because you will never see it as classical science dictates you have to do. Classical science or three-dimensional world, you have to produce something twice. You have to, you know, get a let, it's, there's so much going through to get the scientific establishment. It's called their, it's, it's their Newtonian physics Quantum physics you'll never see. So therefore, if you're going to disprove uh, some of these things that we'll be talking about, you have to disprove it mathematically and show that where the math is wrong. But so far, that math has been established as being correct. So hmm. there, I said it. <laughs> and yeah, I uh, a couple it, things. Yeah. Oh no, you're fine. A couple things. You know, a lot of people uh, you say you know where science and religion, religion and science. You know, it, it there, there is a, uh, a connection where. You know, you'll hear a number of people say, oh, religion has, you know, religion, you know, you can't bring religion into science when it comes to, you know, whatever, you know. And then, um, but I find it interesting how you do, you know, how you mentioned that, you know, there is a connection. Um, you know, you know even Einstein, yeah, Einstein, he, he said science without religion is lame. Religion without, sci- religion without science is blind. So even Einstein knew there was a God. There was, uh, he, I think if he could say it today, he would say it's spiritual. And it's, it's a religious spirituality. But it's you got to put them both together. Dr. Uh, Edgar Case, no, Edgar uh, Mitchell, astronaut, he said that you have to have classical and quantum sciences together to see, have clear perception. I love that statement because you need to put it all together. So many people are out there looking for Bigfoot pounding on trees or or screaming or something, and, and uh, uh, you, <laughs> they don't understand what they're looking for. I mean, if they, right, exactly. I, I talked to a guy this last weekend at a conference I spoke at, and he said, I, I played your sound, the samurai cry, and he said, uh, this thing which my wife had seen up on the hill, uh, I went out on shore. There was in a boat, and he went on the shore, and he uh, played that sound, and this thing came crashing down the the uh, the mountain at him, and I guess he almost walked on water to get back to the boat. <laughs> mm. he, he's a big guy too, but he's a very sincere. He did see one, and uh, he I believe he did anyway. Well, but you know that's why uh, I'm just gonna say that's why you don't you don't broadcast my sounds. I discourage that to people. They want to buy my CDs and play just the Bigfoot sounds and go. Blast them somewhere. Well, first of all, we don't know what these things say in all the right. jabbering we recorded. We don't know what they're saying. You know, it's a language by the human definition of language, but you don't know what they're saying. They might be challenging you. Uh, yeah, some of those exactly. Sound very challenging. <laughs> yeah. Or they might be when I'm looking for a mate. You, you better be careful there. <laughs> yeah, all I mean, that's what a lot on. of people say when. When we go out in the woods and we give off these whoops or tree knocks, you know, like, well, you don't know what you're doing just because we hear them when we're out there. We don't know what they're saying. Um, but then again, you know, from some of my observations, I have my beliefs and theories and what a lot of those uh, may be. And I believe they are different forms of communication one way or another. Um, 
But now, as far as the vote, you know, the, the Sierra sounds, you know, they're from the, you know, out there. And, you know, we get a lot of different vocalizations out here. I know there's some that are recorded, uh, you know, in the Midwest. You got Ohio, the, the ones known as the Ohio sounds. And there's a very interesting one, which I don't know if you've heard it. It's, um, I've listened to it several times, and it's from out of West Virginia. And uh, there's actually a video being played while these sounds are being uh, put out there. And, and of course, in, this, in the video on YouTube, it's kind of ra- it's like a kind of a rainy day, but there's something vocalizing, and I can't recognize it as anything to be known. Um, but it was a long, you know, steady howls and these howls and moan. I don't know, weird tones, but so uh, there's different things, and I wonder. If a lot of what we hear out here, you know, it could be completely different as far as, like, for example, you know, humans, we come in different many form, shapes and forms, uh, you know, um, in ethical backgrounds, you got your Chinese, whatever it may be, speaking all these different languages. And just like out there, in, you know, the Pacific Northwest, you know, Sasquatch is known to be a little bit larger form. And like out here, they average maybe six to eight foot tall, maybe. And uh, so, you know, as far as shapes of sounds, uh, shapes of sizes, and then you got different sounds and tones. I mean, you know, what you might get out there, we might have something different, but, you know, I'm sure maybe, or you, maybe well, it's then, completely I think, different. Yeah, I think there are different types of these things. And I base that on on my studies of, of Greek mythology and, uh, and also biblical history. Biblical, biblical text talks about aliens or fallen angels. The Bible talks about it. Uh, in creating right. humans and creating giants and different types of animals and things like that. Well, um, Egyptians seem to have done the same thing. And you've got the Greek mythology, which goes right back into the demigods, you know, half alien, half human. Uh, could Bigfoot be one of those? And how would that happen and why? Well, I get into all that in my book, Quantum Bigfoot, because I do have a chapter in there getting into this, the spirituality and the different types, different methodology that the dark side uses to try to infiltrate the human genome. And a lot of it's been done. Uh, you know, I think of advanced beings have been here and they definitely have been here. I've seen evidence of that in Peru, Bolivia, and uh, they've been here. Uh, they, they could be here now. I think anybody that thinks there's not aliens around, uh, got their, their head in the sand. Uh, but anyway, uh, Getting back to my point, whatever, whatever that was, uh, I know aliens have been here, and you get into to the demigods of the of the Bible, and uh, and into Greek mythology. You, you, is there a core of truth to any of that? Well, I think there very well could be, and that's what takes me into these things are possibly and probably a hybrid of some type. Because anytime you think you got a DNA out of one of them, it comes out human. That's because they just check the mitochondria DNA when they get into the the male counterpart, the nuclear DNA, which is much more exhaustive and much harder to do, uh, they can't they can't seem to match it up with anything, and uh, that's that kind of throws it right back into what I was just talking about. Because if they oh, are yeah. in yeah. women, you know, <laughs> with an alien DNA manipulating the DNA of a of a primate of some type, uh, who knows who the what type of person it's going to be. I mean, is it going to be bad or is it going to be good? So I think there's good ones and there are bad ones. But you mentioned Chinese or Japanese or different people like that, but we're all human beings made in the right. image of God. These things are not made in the image of God. Whatever they are, they're made by something in humans, I think. And if you get into the dog man and some of these other enigmas that seem to be popping up, well, who knows what's going on? You know, in this uh, multidimensional universe we have, there's got to be a lot of strange things. Who knows? Maybe Star Wars will look real pretty soon. (laughs) 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 Absolutely. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, Zach, uh, Jack wanted to go ahead and jump in there real quick. What uh, What do you got, Zach? Zach? Well, um, uh, what I was going to ask, uh, you were talking about uh, playing the Sierra sounds. Um, I remember I found a uh, recording 
on YouTube. And what I am, uh, not only am I only a uh, cryptozoologist, I also I like to study. Oh, lost him. All right. <laughs> yep. yep. Zach, I don't know what happened. We lost the connection, buddy. I don't know if he still hears us. And I go, here I am. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, Zach. So what, did you, where did you lose the connection at? Uh, that you're a cryptozoologist. Oh, well, yeah, um, uh, not only am I a cryptozoologist, but also I study uh, the behaviorals of of other wildlife. And sometimes I'll, I conduct experiments in the woods, like I'll leave, like, children's toys in the woods, um, like uh, – like the one thing that I had that I used that I had when I was a child was a little uh, wheel that you hit the lever and it belts out an animal sound at random. And I'll leave like choo-choo uh, trains that babies play with and I'll leave them in the woods and I'll leave a digital recorder nearby. And sometimes it just depends on the sound that I get a different reaction out of them. But the one thing that I really did work with was call blasting and I played the Sierra sounds but I didn't get a reaction. You didn't? And I played I played all three tracks that I fa- could find on YouTube uh, in 30-minute intervals. Uh-huh. And you had no and reaction? It, no, it didn't have no reaction, but the one thing that really had a reaction is whenever I played the recording of a German shepherd growling and snarling and barking. That's when the whole woods lit up. Interesting. Yeah. What What happened? Uh, well, kind of the, as soon as I as soon as I turned my uh, sound my uh, blaster for my sounds off, um, I heard uh, whoops to the uh, to the south of me, and then I heard like four or five knocks to the north of me. This was back in January whenever I was doing this, um, but the that's one of the things I found. I find that there's uh, certain things that triggers them, certain things they like and they dislike. Uh huh. It's true. Yeah. Uh, whatever this one that was charging out that guy uh, didn't like what he heard, and that was a samurai cry. So I thought that was kind of interesting. He just told me that this weekend. Uh, the hoops and stuff like that you're hearing, uh, are you sure there's Bigfoot in the area? Undoubtedly. Um, my family has been uh, reporting Bigfoot on this property since, I want to say, about the 40s or the 50s. Have they seen it? Or seen one? Yeah, my mother, uh, my brother, my uh, great grandmother, my grandfather. I believe my great grandfather did uh, before he passed away back in the '60s. I believe that my whole family has seen him. Good. I'm and all of that, it. there's other people like uh, the Amish that live out here that has had encounters with them, stealing their goats um, and their sheep and their hogs. Um, uh-huh. Then there's other people that. Uh, worked out here at the old coal mine that I talked to uh, that is only about five miles from my house, old Brushy Creek coal mine that was ran by Western Fuels, uh, said that they've seen uh, hairy uh, biped creatures hanging around out where the old coal mine was. Mm-hmm. Good. Sounds like a fun spot. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, but the one question I got, in your theory, Ron, do you think that the see that the samurai chatter is only a uh, what's the word uh, an ethnic language like the difference between English and Spanish and French or do you think it is a universally used uh, language among Sasquatch? I don't know if they're all. I don't know. Again, like I said before, they're not all the same. Some can speak, maybe, and some can't. They just scream or yell, trying to attract a mate or get their young one back or something. But uh, what we dealt with in Sierra is that's all I can attest to. Had language and by a complex language, and it seemed to have some English words mixed in it. But they can speak uh, in almost any frequency they want, uh, which gives them a real good edge on hunting if they want to paralyze something like a like a tiger does or something or uh i think they can communicate i think they can we don't know this for sure they communicate an infrasound too which is below human range of of hearing but it's uh, definitely there elephants use it uh giraffes use it large animals use that and it oh can, yeah it can, it can affect humans 
you don't know what's affecting you, but the sound itself will affect you. There's been a couple of times I've been froze up there. I mean, just literally paralyzed, and uh, I couldn't move in, until I was released. And I, or I went backwards. I was heading towards this tree where I thought one of these things was there. This was uh, when we were getting a little bit bolder up there. We didn't feel like they were going to eat us or carry us away, so we said, well, let's just find out what they're all about. So we started uh, coming back at them, and it wasn't until 74 when they uh, actually uh, started interacting with us while I was outside, and uh, that's when I got some more recordings. It's pretty cool. You know, I got off the subject. Uh, I don't think they're the same as Zach. I, I think some can talk, some can't talk. Uh, that's how I feel, and that's all because of the nuclear DNA, the male counterpart. If it is alien, and they are hybrids like I suspicion, then it depends on which alien did what he did, you know, change the DNA. And uh, Do you think that uh, because of the, especially if the ones that can't talk, that can't make sounds uh, make a uh, – a vocal vocalization. Do you think that they have like a sort of a, a sort of sign language? Well, I don't know if it's a sign language, but I know they can whoop back and forth. Uh, they can uh, at least what I've heard. A lot of people hear the whoops. Uh, we've recorded them, and I've got those on my uh, second CD. Uh, but the uh, the sign language is there's, there's a whole group of people that follow that uh, pretty extensively. Like they leave sticks a certain way and. Uh, but that's nothing really new. You know, I think Native Americans did that to show the way for somebody who might be coming after them. So that's, a, that's something they may be doing. I don't know. I've seen some pretty unique stick formations, but, but I've never uh, really checked into trying to look for that myself. I just see it. Hey, guys, I'm sorry. Uh, I had myself pause there for a second. I hope I didn't miss too much because uh, I actually had a phone call from my father. <laughs> he wanted to know if he could give away one. Of, I got foot casts that's kept in his garage. One, um, one of the he asked if he could give one to a little boy in the neighborhood. And I said no. Wait till I come there and pick one out for him because <laughs> I said I want some on display next weekend. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, uh, one more one more question uh, before I turn it back over to Daniel. Um, I've heard, um, and especially it's happened to me and my mother and my brother. Um, they hear their name be called in the woods. Um, do you think that because, like you said, with uh, there's some uh, English words mixed in with uh, samurai chatter that you've heard. Um, do you think that they uh, can mimic voices uh, to ambush and possibly maybe even kill a human? I'm sure they can mimic. Oh, I'm pretty sure they can mimic just about anything they want to mimic. Uh, their frequency range uh, exceeds what we can do as humans. I've heard a lot of reports of them calling their dog's name or calling their name or something uh, when they're out in the woods, and they don't even have their dog with them, but this thing seemed to have noticed them another time or something knew the dog's name. So yeah, they can they can call a person's name just as easy as they, just as easy as I can. Uh, they have that voice range. At least if they can talk, if they're calling out a name, that means they're probably talking. Uh, so the chattering thing mm-hmm. is what if you could ever capture that or hear that. That's that's what Albert Osman talked about in in his abduction story, uh, and that's uh, what a lot of people uh, talk about is. Yeah, chattering. we were talking about that the other day, uh, that story that got brought up in one of our uh, live broadcasts. That there, you know, I know, um, I believe it was uh, uh, by two sources. It was believed on one side and it was not believed on the other. I mean, of course, you know, it happened, what, back in the early 1900s, was it? 1924. It was. that. Yeah, yeah, that one. You're talking about the prospector? Oh, that was Fred Beck. That was not. I was in the same year, 1924, I believe. Oh wow, I'm not familiar with that one. The Osman the one. Miners? I am. Talk about the. Oh no, you mean the single guy was Albert Osman. Right. That was Osman, yeah. but he wasn't interviewed by John Green till the 50s, early 50s. So he he ah. gave his account to John Green, and uh, it was pretty thorough and pretty pinpointed what he seen when he escaped, how he escaped, everything was down to a T. Uh, I have my my own opinion of that because I went up to Toba Inlet. I flew my plane up 
circle light area often for hours and hours and hours uh, and uh, never could find the bowl that uh, Albert Osman was talking about that he was kept for t- six days. And uh, that doesn't mean it wasn't there. It just means coming from Toba Inlet, you don't find it. So we were mainly focusing our search from Toba Inlet in. And I don't think, uh, I think he's probably an honest person telling what he thought was the truth, but I don't believe he was in Toba Inlet. It just doesn't make sense. Mm. I was up there with Peter Byrne. I was up there with uh, Al Berry and a photographer. And, and my opinion, and I write, write about this, my, I got a whole chapter about Albert Osman in my book, Quantum Bigfoot. But uh, it's just, it doesn't make sense. If you don't see what he said he saw uh, and uh, from Toby Inlet. There's a lot yeah. of inlets up there. I think he just looked at a map 30 years later when John Green was talking to him and said, that's where I was. The Indian that rode him up there, um, all that is just uh, didn't add up to me hmm. or to any of us, really. Yeah, it's still a very interesting story. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, and that's the thing with a lot of stories, and, and, and you know, I, I hear a lot. And even with some of the reports of the stories, I, you know, I've been told personally, uh, some of them I believe that could, uh, you know, how I believe that are true or have some truth to them because from others that shared similar stories or other reports within general areas and, and you know, descriptions. I believe what they're sharing with me uh, supports the, uh, another story that I've gathered. And But then again, you always have those ones that are like, hmm, you always have that doubt, you know. Like, uh, you know, you might have storytellers out there or maybe they like to believe they've seen what they said they see. And, you know, then again, you know, of course, we know there's a lot of misidentification out there in the world as well. So... Um, and time can time can change things too, you know. Like Albert Osman, thirty years later, he was interviewed. So, you know, he might have had a couple of little things twisted in there, but the way John Green put it together, it made it, his escape route and everything like that all made really good sense. He Mount Baker, da 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 down this river and that. So all that kind of fit. The Toba Inlet did not fit. So that's all I'm saying. I don't doubt that uh, he didn't have an experience because he went into too much detail and. And swore by it to the yeah to the crown. <laughs> so, well, it's like a story I've told a lot since 2014 because it, it, an encounter that me and five others shared together. I mean, it was something that we're never forget, never going to forget. You know, but the thing is, well, you know, with the description and the details that we were able to share, you know, to some that might hear, it's like, oh, this is not that exciting as if you were to hear a daytime encounter, because the event happened at, you know, it was after midnight. But the thing is, as I share and tell the story and give the best details as possible from what we did observe, you know, there's only so much I could put into that, you know, if just based off of what we did observe. And so, but as far as sharing the story multiple times, the only thing, you know, we could share, you know, as time goes by, you know, sometimes the, uh, I guess you could say the enthusiasm of, you know, because it's happened four years ago now, um, you know, so, you know, there's only so much excitement I can put into the story, you know, <laughs> you, know just, you know what I mean? So it's like, sure. I, I can tell you the story word for word, but, you know, it's not it's going to sound kind of plain and dull. I mean, well, so. and, you know, you can have, you can tell a story and then pass it to the next generation and they can tell the story and so on and so forth. That's how. A lot of myth or a lot of uh, uh, facts get turned into myth is through the right. generation of story trying to be told, and all of a sudden, wham, you got yourself a whole almost a different story. Uh, that's why we took notes. Uh, Al Berry took a lot of notes. He wrote about this actually in 1976, 78, something like that. The Bantam book co authored it with uh, Ann Slate about Bigfoot. He gives our account in the first three chapters. And he talks about a couple of the strange things, but uh, the other strange things is what got me into quantum uh, science. Uh, just uh, lights, uh, sounds that don't, you can't explain the sound. If you're eight miles in the wilderness, 8,400 feet in elevation, here it is in the middle of the night and you hear a car door slam outside your shelter. <laughs> wow. Tell me how that, you, can't, you can't drive up there, you can't even get up there hardly by foot, unless let's take a motorcycle or anything. It's just... Uh, Sounds like you think your camp's being tore apart and you look out when it's all over with and nothing's nothing's been changed. 
I say camp, I mean our stove area where our groceries are kept. You think the barrels are being ripped away from the trees. And, and you hear all those sounds. It's not like just one of us hears, you know, the whole group of us who was up there at the time. Again, there's only six of us, but sometimes two of us would be there, sometimes four of us would be there, and uh, occasionally five would be there. But that's called an Alberry. And Alberry, uh, he, he drove a lot further than we did to get into this area, the Sierras. So he wasn't there near as, as often. And he never even got a glimpse of one of these things. So all of us have gotten glimpses or good sightings one. And uh, so it's very important uh, when you're hearing a sound to try to couple something else or see if there's anything else that can be coupled with it, like a footprint or a sighting or something else. So you can say, this is what made the sound. I, I, I ask people this question. Are they, how many here have ever saw a Bigfoot? Well, if you might raise your hand. How many here have ever heard of Bigfoot? Oh, their hands are going up everywhere. How many <laughs> here have ever, how many here have ever seen what made the sound? <laughs> no hands go up at all. And that's kind of important because yeah. if you if you don't see what made the sound, you don't know for sure. Bigfoot can he can imitate an owl. What they do is they whoop back and forth, but owls can do that too. Uh, right. Just, uh, you know, it's just keep an open mind about what you, and the reality uh, of it all because. It could just be an owl. I thought I heard an owl one time up there, and uh, thought I'd record it way up the canyon. And uh, my daughter was with me, and I turned the little cassette recorder I had on, but the speaker switch, you know how that can, I left it on, it squealed from the mic <laughs> that I had on my lapel. And that squeal, that owl that I thought I was listening to, turned into a Bigfoot chatter. So that was kind of interesting. They can sound just like an owl. Uh, yeah, that's interesting because, you know, in my area where I like to focus on, um, you know, it's my area of interest and also a, a major area that I focus in. And it's not just from the encounters I've had. I mean, I found, you know, what I consider evidence, you know. Um, well, the thing is, I've observed a lot of the wildlife in there. And the one thing I could honestly tell you, besides coyotes that are uh, well abundant in the area, is the barred owl. We have tons mm-hmm. of barred owls. Um, you know, at nighttime, they're very active at night. Uh, I mean, I've seen them during the daytime. I got pictures of them when I was walking through trails, you know, and just sit right there in front of you on a tree limb. I was like, wow, you know, and so I'm. Um, but barred owls, uh, there's one of the main things that we do hear a lot of in the area. Uh, and I've heard, you know, a lot of people are familiar with their common vocalization, you know, the vo- their common vocals. You know, but I've had other people out there and just get excited and swear up and down we got a Bigfoot screaming or making this weird noise right behind our camp. And I was like, you know, you, you don't want to, you, don't want to uh, you know, well, I don't know what the right word is. You don't want to insult them. But, you know, it's like, you know better what that is. It's like, well, you know, that's actually a barred owl. I know that's not their common sound. They don't do that that often, but that's a barred owl, you know. So, you know, and I've had people out in the woods and point out scat and said, that's bear scat. I said, no, that's horse manure. I said, people go horseback riding <laughs> through on these trails around here. You know, I said, we, that's the one thing that's very common out there. It's a very remote area. It's a, it's part of the, our national forest out here. But there's all mm-hmm. old logging trails, all you know, logging roads, a lot of trails. Um, I mean, I know the area. It's over 130,000 acres of national forest. But a good portion of it, I mean, I know a lot of it. I've been, I've done a lot of exploring on my own, you know. And But I like to get other people out there, you know, the, so I can share the area with them and let them see for themselves the beauty of it and, you know, also a possible chance of maybe seeing or, you know, or finding something out there, you know, you know, but, um, so yeah, there's, you know, that's one thing I tell people a lot is before you start seeking, you know, and I know Zach's probably heard me say this a million times, but before you could, you know, go seeking the unknown, you got to understand what is known, you know, so, <laughs> so, yeah, but, um, well, what you might hear is a 400-pound owl. That'd be the difference because their amplitude is uh, really big, real big. Yeah, oh, yeah. That, that gives them away. Uh, so it didn't give them away when I was here, hearing it. That was back in the 90s when I uh, remember that owl. And uh, so anyway, it uh, they can do it. They can call your name. 
They can, I think they cover their tracks, not not physical tracks, but they cover their presence by trying yeah. to mimic other animals, you know. And hitting on a tree is, is a singling device, in my opinion, of of uh, certain codes. I got rhythmic sounds recorded on my CDs where you can, it's obviously a rhythmic type something that's answered by some rocks clucking together from another side of the area there. So they're surrounding us when that happened, and uh, really, it's, it's an exciting time. As long as it oh, throws rocks at you, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually had that happen be, uh, before. Oh, really? I had a small <laughs> one. Yeah, and a large one. It didn't land at me. It actually, after crossing a creek, I had crossed the creek to continue onto the trail where the trail went. But as soon as I got to the other side, boom, this big rock landed in the creek right next to me. I mean, you know, I didn't see it happen, but it happened right there because, you know, it was, Nothing else in the thick bushes, all those mountain laurel and thick brush right there, in the, you know, on the other side of the creek, you know, something came lobbing over there and landed right next to me. So I was like, that's pretty cool. You know, it was exciting. You know, I was like, okay, you know, but I didn't see nothing. You know, it just it happened right next to me, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, they, throw like that's rocks. Awesome. they do throw rocks. You know, there's a lot of reports of that, but they've never been known to hit anybody with a rock. They right, for, exactly. I never had that happen. They do it, and I think, to about, get you out of the area, to scare you, uh, because maybe they got a young one, maybe who knows what's going on in their life, but but there's something going on they don't want you in that area, and they'll let you know by throwing a rock, but again, they'll just, they'll place it in a grapefruit rock size over your head or something, but they won't hit you in the head, thank goodness. Right. They could, they could wipe us out anytime they wanted to. And uh, they're big, they're huge, they're strong, they're fast, they're stealthy, uh, and uh, they can do things that we do not do. Uh, we, I think, at one time was able to do. We just have not reached our potential as human beings yet. That's what Christ was talking about. You know, if you want to get into, you know, that's what uh, a lot of religions. And I, I don't like the word religions because I think it takes away some people from spirituality. You talk about how, you know, how religion crams things down your throat sometimes that you just can't swallow and uh, you, you start looking elsewhere then well that kind of happened to me but you know it happened to me after after the uh, started encountering these things because I was involved in a church and uh, first thing I wanted to do is find out where giants came from that was my first quest so I started looking and but the uh, the structural ways of a lot of religions are, are I think a little bit harmful I don't like to say that because there's so many of them do so good and nice people, but they can also uh, be very dog me and uh, down judgmental. But uh, oh, I, I yeah. talk about this in my book. That's why I can say something now because I, I got somebody that's very religious almost challenged me and then she actually did challenge me on some things I talked about because I, I, I get into the, you know, if you're a religious person that was saved from the pits of hell at the ripe old age of four years old and been brought up in a yeah. church, yeah. you're going to believe what that church taught you. And you're not going to step out of that paradigm, not easily anyway. Well, I think everybody has to get out of any fixed paradigm with Bigfoot because there are no real experts in this field. An expert is somebody who can't learn anything else about a subject. Right. And I think we all got a lot to learn about this subject. Fun stuff. Though. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. As long as you don't get eaten, of course you never know if you don't come back from camping and people miss you, they don't. <laughs> they don't know what happened to you. But anyway, the oh. good ones and bad ones. That's my. That's what I take away from that. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um. So yeah, as far as uh, hold on one second. Yeah, I know you got the West Coast. You know, I know you got reports here on the east coast you know i mean i know you you said you mainly focus with the sierra sounds and, and a lot of the west coast out there um have you ever given much attention to uh, out here maybe uh any at the on the along the east coast as far as anything you've ever picked up to look into i haven't other than just what i've read uh just because it's so far away and there's so much going on out here i'm in washington yeah. now the Olympic peninsula and uh a lot goes on here and in Oregon and there's enough to keep you busy here all the time. And, uh, just, 
I don't need to travel back there as much as I'd like to read the reports and see if there's any commonalities, but that's why I went to Peru. That's why I went to Nepal. That's why I went into Siberia to see if there's any commonalities being reported that associate themselves with, with what I've ran into in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Now you mentioned uh, earlier, you mentioned Peru. Um, mm-hmm. Now Peru has some interesting things going on there, especially with uh, you're, you're probably uh, familiar with uh, Mr. Brian Forrester? Yeah, I know him well. Yeah, oh, okay, awesome. Tours together. Yeah, I know he's been dealing with the, the, the you know the, the skulls, the you know, elongated skulls, and uh, and all the different things there. And I know recently, finally, the DNA results came back. Um, I have not personally seen or, or heard the results. The one thing I did hear off the side, you know, when the information about the DNA results were being uh, that were coming available, that they did mention something about uh, some of the skulls, where they had mentioned how some were deformed, uh, you know, from natural, you know, that were, you know, unnatural, where it was, you know. Well, you know, you're referring to the elongated skulls, and uh, the, the common thought behind that has been that it was that the Incas uh, cradleboarded their youth, the royalty, uh, right. and they did. They, the, the Incas did do that, but they were uh, mimicking, we believe, this pre-Inca culture, which I think bred into them too. But these things had naturally elongated skulls, and they were able to do, we believe. We associate them with the megalithic structures, which are in Peru and Bolivia and all over down there. Uh, Machu Picchu, you've heard about these places and the work they do. Well, <laughs> when you see these over 100-ton boulders that have been placed up on this 13,000-foot mountain, hauled mm. there from miles away, and they're, they're fit in like a puzzle, like a jigsaw puzzle. It's just amazing. There's no mortar. It's not like they cemented them in there. They the stones somehow will fit perfectly. Uh, yeah, exactly. You're talking it's about a quarter perfect. of a mile. <laughs> and that's not just one spot. That's You see that in Cusco, too, the walls. You see where the, the uh, Spaniards built on top of the, uh, of the, uh, the megalithic boulders. And then uh, you see where, uh, yeah, different cultures have done different things. But the base of it all is these boulders that fit together, you're not going to move them. <laughs> and the thing is, some of those walls are five foot thick, the thickness of a boulder. You go on the inside, it's the same thing. It's it's just wow. fa- unfathomable how, how that can happen with our technology today. So the, we think, and most people think, that those the elongated skulls are a definite sign, that because they weren't human, by the way. We don't have a single parietal, which means, you know, the parietal bones, we have one on each side of our head. Right, uh, these are only you know, single ones. in the back, you know, the cranial front. Uh, they only have one parietal. Yet, right, long I remember period. reading that. And they had yeah, a little, okay. almost almost 30% more brain matter uh, space. So when the Incas elongated their cradle board, or cradle board their, they call cranial deformation, by the way. And when they did that to their royalty of the youth, uh, they do it right after birth mm-hmm. so that their head would get elongated. But it didn't give them any more brain matter. So they still couldn't do what this pre-Inca culture did. This is opinion because none of us were there, but something did that, that, and I think they did it with vibrational frequencies, same rule that goes with so many other things. Uh, because how else do you get some of these boulders, these structures, which now are being found all over the world? Uh, so something with higher technology than we have today or the knowledge of something, and I think the knowledge is in quantum physics, where the vibrational frequencies are explained. Of course, you got to know what the vibrational frequency is of something to make it happen. we got to change right. our vibrational frequency. I'm rambling on here, but I'm having fun right now. <laughs> oh, you no. Can, I, if you I'm raise your it. own personal vibration, you, 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 you have a vibrational frequency. Some days it's lower than others. Uh, if right. you get it high enough, uh, you won't be sick anymore. If you get it low enough, you're going to get sick all the time. And you can change well, your vibrational frequency by how you how you react to things. And just don't get depressed. That's positive nature. You get on the positive side of things, and, and then all of a sudden you're not so sick as you used to be. And you can actually raise your vibrational frequency to, well, listen to this one. You can like it. Well, you go out of our three-dimensional perception. 
How'd you like that one? Because mm. <laughs> it changes into light, and then it'll change into energy only. And uh, I think that's why a lot of people report, and I've heard these reports for years, how Bigfoot disappears. All of a sudden, they're trawling on the trackway, too, and the trackway stops. Well, that happened to me. I used to discard those people. Say, oh, these people are nuts. Nothing disappear. If you can't see it, it isn't there. Well, that's not true. There's a lot of stuff happens that you don't see. A lot of stuff around us right now that we probably aren't witnessing or knowing. Um, there's so much to this quantum field, and I encourage anybody to start looking into it because it's just uh, it's it's phenomenal to me. The more I got into it, the better it got. How it explains so many issues that are troubling us now. Your personal vibration frequency can rise high enough to where you won't get sick of anything. You will illness can't stay in your body. <clears throat> and it just goes on and on with this uh, frequency thing because uh, they're finding out now that uh, frequency can heal, will heal. Uh, it's just scientifically, I haven't got anything to quote you with this other than I just read it, but your vibrational frequency can actually heal your body of cancer. Nothing can stay inside a body that's that has the right racial frequency. By the way, let me mention that I write about this too. <laughs> it's having fun. Uh, the uh, the vibrational frequency of the Earth lowers it in the evening time, and our vibrational frequency when you're relaxed in your alpha state, where you're not totally in the beta state of sleep. We you know beta. Well, beta is not sleep, but beta is when you're right awake, analyzing everything. When you back off and just don't analyze things, you're, you're relaxed. Your body is trying to sleep, but your mind's still working a little bit, but you're not analyzing anything. That's the alpha state. One of the alpha states, the highest state. Well, I think, in fact, this is a fact, too. I've got the numbers in my book. But um, the Earth's frequency lowers. Uh, our frequency lowers, and they almost become the same at nighttime. And you find a lot of Bigfoot encounters are at nighttime. Uh, you don't see them much in the daytime, but they are in tune with the earth. They probably have the same frequency as the earth, and all, like all animals do, and they're able to do what they do. Uh, we are so out of sync with our lives, <laughs> the way we do oh, things. Yeah. Uh, we're not part of the earth like, like they are, like like animals are. Unless you got an indoor cat. Yeah, actually, I got two little kittens in the room next to me right now. They sound like they're <laughs> they're my daughter's cats. They sound they sound like they're a couple of bulls. They're they're playing around, bumping the walls. They sound like they're humongous, like dinosaurs in there. <laughs> oh, they're so cute when they're little like that. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, um, but there was yeah, there was something I was gonna bring up. Cause, you know, you were you were talking about the uh, you know how people will find tracks and they stop and everything like that. It reminded me of a conversation I had with uh, Miss Kimberly McGeorge a while back, and uh, it was she actually had me on her show, um, and we were talking, and you know, and and then something she 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 challenged me. She she want you know she was talking about you know if she could get some group of people together, she wanted me to you know uh, form an expedition the, up in my area. And she told me she's, you know, because you know, I, I'm a very, I'm very skeptical. You know, there's a lot of things I don't believe, but yet I, I want to believe them if they're true. But I just need something to support it, you know. And you know, so I guess it's safe to say I do have an open mind. But you know, there's some things I need to have some kind of evidence to show me that that that's real. For example, clo- cloaking. Now. She, uh, you know, she challenged me that she will prove to me that cloaking is real, and she wanted to take me up. You know, she wanted to, you know, get together and go out, you know, camping or, you know, and and she said she was going to prove to me that cloaking is real. I don't know how how <laughs> easy something like that is to prove. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm all for it if somebody could prove to me. You know, I mean, I'm all about it. You know, but so you know. I know it's easier to say uh, just to, just to go along with it, you know, with a lot of the theories and a lot of the beliefs that are out there. And um, so, you know, I mean, I like, you know, someone on my, I'm very objective in a lot of ways, but then I'm very open-minded too at the same time. So. Well, then, then you should read how, how that can be because there is a law and it's the vibrational frequency again. Um, and it's mathematically shown and you can, I got all. This. I got a whole bunch of that called quantum time, quantum 
uh, dis- disappearing and stuff like that. How that is possible through quantum physics, but that's also why Christ said you got to believe. You won't see, but you got to believe. So you you're in a state where you can't tell me how big the universe is. So you're in a state of unless you can see, you don't believe. And right. You you um, you won't ever see quantum physics. You won't ever see it. You just see the effects of it, like telepathy. Uh, everything's a vibration. You get into all that stuff, and uh, there's an answer to the, the enigmas that are around these creatures too. And I think that's it. I think we have those abilities. We just haven't uh, gone into them yet, yeah. evolved into them yet. Like telepathy, for example, I, I've heard you know. Well, people mention it online, Facebook, and different posts, and in some of the groups where people mention, "Oh, I'll, you know, I've heard, yeah, the Bigfoot spoke to me," and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this. I'm like, really? I said, like, how, how do you know a Bigfoot's talking to you? I mean, how do you know it's a Bigfoot? I mean, <laughs> you know, things like that get get me. I'm like, I'm, like, yeah. I'm not understanding that. You know, is that? I mean. That'd be cool if that's real, really. I mean, that's the way I'm looking at it. That would be cool if stuff like that's real, you know. Well, you know, well, we uh, what, I find, yeah, Zach, what I find a lot is uh, until someone's experienced something unique, that's what it takes. Right. Uh, that's, I think that's what it takes. And so many people have experienced stuff like that. And, of course, now you've got to ask if it's telepathy or if they read in their mind or uh, are they just imagining things. Right. You can just, you know, your brain is a great confabulator. <laughs> it just, you know, it, it fills in a lot of blanks for you when they're not real. And, uh, yeah, I but, guess it's the same, same, uh, you know, same situation as if you have a non-believer of Bigfoot. You know, there's a lot of people that di- didn't believe. There's some people that said they used to mock the whole the thought of the existence, and then they've, you know, and then it's happened to them where they've actually seen for themselves and couldn't believe what they were seeing, and. You know, so you know, uh-huh. I guess it, it kind of hits them. You know, it's like something they never expect to happen, and they see this, like, this ain't human. This is not no other known animal. What the heck am I looking at? You know, so, <laughs> so it's a quite the experience for a lot of people. You know, but it changes a lot of lives, and well, it, it, it doesn't sure make them look mine. at it. it changed, yeah, it changed mine and yours, and a lot of people listening. I'm sure. Uh, oh it's, yeah. It's just, but it's a it's a interesting edge of science, edge of borders. We're on the edge of something here because these things are multiplying. Uh, we're uh, transgressing into the forest a lot more, and we're all kind of here. I might mention this though: uh, you won't find them unless it's by accident. They they find you, and that has a lot to do with who you are as a person and what your intentions are. Because I do believe they can read the aura. They can read. Um, how what your intentions are. We had guns up at our camp. I mean, high powered guns, where we could have shot at them and maybe hit them. I mean, right. the ones right side of the shelter, but you know we didn't. And uh, so I, I think they knew we wasn't going to shoot at them unless they came in after us. That's what we were prepared to do. And when you hear some of those sounds, you got to wonder: Did they? <laughs> were they ready? We don't know if they were discussing which one they want to eat first, which one, <laughs> what, what part you want to eat first. <laughs> Or right. let's, let's carry him away. Let's carry him away to another place. Uh, we don't know, and we didn't know. And we was looking back on a lot of stuff we did and trying to trick them and trying to outsmart them, like we thought they were just some kind of animal that hadn't been discovered yet, which they are. But but they're a lot more clever and more intelligent than most people want to give them credit for. And I'll tell you that for sure. Uh, ours were in the Sierras anyway, and that's. Uh, been an experience, I'll tell you, but you can't out trick them. We tried camera traps, we tried all kinds of things, and they would see it coming. You know, we put that black thread six, eight feet above the, between these trees, and they'd go around the tree. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. I, yeah. Hey, uh, Ron, um, Zach is. I, I have a question, real yeah, quick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you was talking about on the telepathy thing. Uh, me and my mother are empathic. Do you think that? people who are empathic have a better connection with a Sasquatch? Yeah, I do. Because your pineal gland isn't calcified. And I talk about that in my book. I keep talking about my book here, but it's got those questions in there. 
uh, what we have is a third eye. You know, we have all the elements of an eyeball except for the actual eyeball inside our head called a pineal gland. And it's known in Egyptian culture all as the third eye. A lot of culture, voodoo culture, uh, people who have that sense of telepathy and who can sense things and know what they, they have a, a connection with that third eye into their, their brain matter, which is so important, I think. That's what what we do is we calcify with our diets. We calcified our uh, our pineal gland, and it's not as easy to communicate. Telepath, tele, telepathy is, in my book, I call it quantum entanglement. And it's basically what oh, just about all species do, and we can do it. We just, a lot of us uh, don't realize it, so we don't even try to communicate or think, oh, well, so what? Mary's probably all right. Then all of a sudden you hear the next day Mary got in a car wreck. Well, we have a sense inside of us that can sense everything if we can just hook up to it. And uh, it's mm-hmm. very important to, to know that. And there's a, there's a sequence to make that happen. It comes from your heart, which has the most energy of anything, and that, that needs to communicate with that pineal gland, which will communicate with your brain. And when you connect the three, uh, you've got a winning, a winning thing, as long as it's based in love and caring for other people. Once you start hurting people or have something that's going to hurt them, uh, that that takes you away from all that, and that's that's why Christ taught love. Uh, I sound like I'm a proponent of that, but so did Buddha. <laughs> a lot of <laughs> a lot of uh, religions teach love. Some of them have gone off. Excuse me. Their core of truth was love, but a lot of times it brings out from that after man has it for a while, he changes uh, the circle you got to jump through. Uh, there you go. Here's a here's an interesting question, and um, I can't remember. I, I have not read the book, but it came out of one individual's book. You may be familiar with it, but uh, there's a theory where there's a possibility where Bigfoot may be artistic. I know this is kind of a random question, but it's uh, especially for a lot of what we experience and what we see. You know, some of the things we find, if it is Bigfoot related, you know, we don't understand why or for what reasons they may build or do the things they do. Um, some people think even tree knocks, you know, because, you know, consecutive tree knocks, uh, or, or just different weird things that we experience. Could it be from a form of autism that they may possess? Well, you don't know. Uh, anything's possible. I don't think anything's impossible, uh, nowadays, but, uh, I know the Ontario sounds that I heard so much about, uh, Scott Nelson seems to think it's, uh, either a, a retarded Bigfoot or a, uh, uh, something with a brain issue, but it is trying. It sounds like it's trying to talk, and mm. uh, that's pretty pretty cool uh, recording. He's been working with that a long time, but Scott can't attest. To the, uh, he he just won't say it's real because it's it's he can't pull out a morphine stream, a group of words. But anyway, there's a lot of people recording. Uh, not a lot of people. There's a handful of people that actually can capture some recordings. Uh, and Scott likes to hear anything with a morphine stream, not just a scream or a yell. He can't do nothing of that. He's a language guy. He's not a Bigfoot guy, really. He wasn't anyway until this. But right. he studies languages, and he teaches Russian, Persian, Spanish. Uh, he's just uh, a language guy. And he knows how to transcribe unknown languages. That's what he did with the Sierra Sounds. He transcribed an a unknown language with it. Don't know what they're saying, but he knows it's, it's language by the human definition of language, which means a morphine stream. Awesome. Yeah, because, you know, that is very awesome. You know, people such as Scott Nelson and, you know, along with a few others I've always had in mind since I've been involved with Bigfoot Research is be great to have a, you know, a connection with these people. And, you know, I know a lot of you guys have been involved with, you know, this stuff for many years and you've gotten to, you know, especially, you know, you, you attend a lot of these conventions and, you know, you speak at a lot of different things. And so you get to meet and get well acquainted with a lot of these, like Jeff Meldrum, for example. I mean, I met him for the first time last year in Ohio, which was awesome, you know. And I mean, I was blown away how outgoing and friendly and, you know, how informative he is in person, you know, uh, not just watching him on a documentary for a change, you know. So, um, but, yeah, you know, like a real, him, he, he's a real gentleman. I went with him and uh, Dr. John Begnerego over to Siberia and into Russia. We spoke at the Darwin Museum of National Science over there. And uh, I, I, I roomed with him. I, I mean, I know him. I speak with him quite often. Uh, of course, John Benenegger, you know, just passed away recently. 
And, right. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm actually, uh, yeah, Jeff will be speaking with me here again uh, in August over here in Washington. Oh yeah, yeah. I I seen your post there. Uh, yeah, where's that taking place at? Kingston, uh, just uh, west of across the water, west of uh, Seattle. Just a short oh, okay. ferry ride though. Yeah. And ah. Beautiful video. You know, I was over there looking it over. You know, it's just really high tech stuff they got there. I'll be really anxious to be there. It'll be fun. Yeah, one of uh, one of our other speakers at the event coming up here, uh, Mr. Darby Orcutt. He's uh, he teaches at the uh, North Carolina State University. Um, you know, I've been on several different phone call conversations with him, and one of the things he's actually shared with me is a. Uh, it's a project that's pretty much been kept on the download, and the project uh, one of the people involved was is the you know or was the late Dr. John Bindernagel, and John had actually just right before he had passed, had just sent him a series of casts to kind of study and look over him. Um, so yeah, because uh, Darby Orca, he's actually you know gathering together. Uh, I believe he does have a primatologist that um, that kind of stepped on board, a biologist and. And, uh, you know, and he's not a scientist, but he's uh, somebody, one of the things he, the courses that the university allows him to teach is, is Bigfoot related actually. And, um, it, which is kind of surprising, which I hope he speaks a lot about this. I, I don't know what he's going to bring up. Um, I know a lot of this information he has shared with me. Um, you know, he recently came up about a, a couple a month or two ago and I, uh, he, he's, uh, he's been wanting to get together with me. And uh, so we uh, we went on a, a nice uh, nice good hike uh, one weekend. He came up, me, him, my daughter, and uh, one of my other uh, team members. And uh, so you know, and I really appreciated having him there too. You know, he's you know being who he is, he's got a very strong object uh, objective view on a lot of things. And, and uh, but from what he's gathered, what we can actually experience, which I he actually saw, you know, kind of picked up that you know. He said, yeah, you know, you know, he could, he's a Bigfoot believer, but he was being very objective, but I think he kind of saw a few things, but, um, so yeah, basically part of what he's trying to do is, you know, how a lot of mainstream science, uh, they pretty much neglect or ignore any piece of evidence that, that we, what we consider evidence. And so one of the things he wants to work towards and hoping to accomplish maybe in the future is where, trying to start more or less educating people on how to use protocol and collecting the evidence you know, where science may start accepting it, you know, which would, you know, it's cool. So, and, um, yeah, it's you know, hard which, to find science, uh, scientists that'll uh, take on this subject because they, they, it challenges their, uh, their career really. Uh, yeah, they, when they absolutely. Take this on their academia just doesn't want to accept it. And that's the, but that's where they, They've been raised, they've been uh, educated that way, and they can't normally get out of that paradigm, that box. Uh, Jeff Meldrum's out of it, you know, he, but he still has to maintain that discipline of, of uh, classical science, which any scientist will have to do that if he wants to keep his tenure. Uh, right, of, which is very understandable. Grover, yeah, Grover Kratz, who lives right here in this town I live in now, Squim, uh, he passed away years ago, but he said, you take a toll professionally you don't get promotions when you should you don't get raises when you should uh, dr curland university of wyoming who did the study on our sounds he transferred over to vancouver island by the way that's where dr john benenegal was living i've seen him just before he passed on but a lot of stuff goes on over there which uh, you mm. wonder how i was also up, uh, up in the canada along those islands way up above camel river for a week on a boat hopping from island to island they they used to say they see these creatures swimming from island to island, so we was trying to see if we could get, get some kind of evidence of that, but we didn't. But it was a fun trip, i got to tell you that. There's a lot of country up there, wilderness, that uh, mm. has not been explored. And you got to watch out, because a lot of grizzly bears up there, too. Oh, no, I bet. Just, yeah. Yeah. And now, we have a oh, lot of black bears here in Virginia, but, yeah, they're very skittish. Uh, I've had encounters both day and night, but... By the time you see them, they're already going the other way anyway. The yeah, I know. Are... If you're if you're if you're upwind from them, they got yeah. olfactory sense. It just won't. You know, it's better than a dog's. And uh, but however, you can sneak up on them if you if you got the winds just right, or yeah, be still and let them walk towards you if the wind's right. 
I had a sour yeah. two cubs pretty close to me up there once when I just I didn't see I want to see how close they could get before they smell me or something. And got within just a few, well, probably 25, 30 feet of me when the cubs did. When you got wind of me, never did see me though. Their eyesight's horrible. But, oh wow! Uh, yeah, black bears are skittish, very skittish uh, uh, in the Sierras. Mm. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> wow! So much for bear, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those um, are the bear facts, sir. <laughs> Zach, uh, did you want to throw in any anything else for uh, Ron? No, not that I can think off off the top of my head. Well, my uh, so oh. my uh, email is Ryan at goodsounds dot com. If anybody wants that, I'm I get questions asked me all the time. Or you can connect with me on my website, which is Ron Morehead M O R E H A D dot com. Dot com. Yeah. And yeah, that's those... another thing. When I when I release this, uh, when I edit and release this uh, on the radio publicly, I um, I did include uh, a couple of those links. Um, one is actually where they can find you on Facebook as well, and then your website. I made sure I included that as well. Um, and then anybody that wants to come out and meet Ronald J. Moorhead, you need to come out June thirtieth and come out to Fishersville, Virginia, at the Augusta Expo. And he will be there. So I want to make sure I get that out there. And if you have not done so, you can go to VirginiaBigfootCon.com to buy your tickets. Uh, so, or you can go to our Facebook page, which is the ECBRO first annual Virginia Bigfoot conference. Give us a like, make sure you share our page too. So I want to make sure I throw that out there as well. And, Ron, uh, as we're coming to a close, uh, did you want to share with us any uh, anything you want to throw out there? Uh, I know you got some up- upcoming events uh, besides our event. I don't know if you wanted to throw anything out there or to plug anything in there. Um, or, well, I was just out to one this last weekend that I spoke at in Oregon. I, I'm here for the rest of this week, then I go to your place in Virginia. I'll be there till the 4th of July. I come back here and take off to California on the 11th. And I'll be down there on expedition for three weeks. Oh, um, very I'll awesome. Back up here. Then August 5th, when I get back, I'm speaking at the Point Casino here across from Sale there at Kingston. And uh, that'll be fun. And uh,